This is Vern Benham Grimsley with the Spiritual Renaissance broadcast. What is religion? There are probably as many different definitions of religion as there are poems, graffiti, limericks, proverbs, epigrams, anagrams, and philosophical scrawlings inscribed on the walls of the public lavatories of the world. At one time or another, almost every poet, philosopher, and newspaper editor has felt the hour ripe to deliver himself of a definition of religion. George Bernard Shaw defined it as that which binds men to one another. It is irreligion which sunders. Matthew Arnold described religion as morality touched by emotion. The philosopher Alfred North Whitehead called it what the individual does with his own solitariness. Thus the understandings of religion run the entire range from Shaw saying it brings and holds men together with others to Whitehead saying it is a matter of what a person does when apart from others, when he or she is utterly alone. Yet there is one common thread of meaning in all positive definitions of religion, that it is a quest after values. The world's most famous historian, Professor Arnold Toynbee, wrote of religion, if the world manages to keep the peace and also to keep its population within limits, I think the greatest problem of all will be a revival of religion. I believe man cannot live without freedom, and spiritual life is the sphere in which he needs freedom most of all." End of quote. What then is the relevance of religion? It is this. The world has problems because people have problems. This planet is often violent because its people are often violent. Consider it scientifically. One underlying assumption of science is that for every cause, there is an effect, and for every effect there is a cause. What causes violence and hatred, wrong motivations? And religion possesses the power to change, to transform human motivations. This is the essence of its relevance. That in the finding and knowing of God, you literally become a new person. The scholar Blackmore once defined religion as the future tense of fear. Baron de Holbach described ancient religions as antique monuments to ignorance, superstition, and savagery, and modern religions as, quote, ancient follies rejuvenated. Certainly, any skeptic can concoct a remark to ridicule religion, but real religion remains the highest aspiration of human experience, a questing for supreme values. Religion is man grasping Godward, and finding that for which he seeks. Focus on the distinction between authentic and inauthentic religion and consider a parallel. How does one tell the difference between a genuine coin and a counterfeit? According to the Federal Treasury Department, a counterfeit coin will usually have uneven ridges around the edges, can be cut with a knife, feels greasy to the touch, and will not ring when dropped onto a hard surface. Similarly, there are ways to detect the differences between genuine and counterfeit spiritual teachings. Authentic religious truth always enhances one's love of God and man, augments the appreciation of goodness, truth, and beauty, is consistent with physical and mental health, and promotes peace, purpose, and an inner sense of joy. Dare thus to live the truth wherever you may find it. Further consider this distinction between true religion and false religion. Three fundamental aspects of human existence are thinking, feeling, and acting. False religion may influence the way you feel, but not the way you think and act. False religion may influence the way you think, but not the way you feel and act. False religion may even influence both the way you think and the way you feel, yet with little impact upon your behavior. False religion may easily make you feel holy and make you think theologically without fundamentally transforming the way you act and fundamentally are. Only true religion is able to touch and transform all three aspects of human experience. Thinking, feeling, and acting. Belief may change your mind, but faith will transform your life. Authentic faith liberates the full potential of body, mind, and spirit in the sublime and stirring service of the God of this universe of universes. Great intellect is thus not necessary to religious experience, nor to the living of a great life. When common people decide to live by uncommon values, 
No longer are they common people. What is greatness? A man is as great as what he values, as noble as his ideals are high. Whether you have the IQ of a genius or have to take off your shoes to count to 20, you can still choose to live by nobler standards, higher ideals. You can choose to live by the very will of the living God, the most exalted standard of behavior and excellence which mortal man can know. These are the important issues of religion. There are other aspects which are of lesser importance. Too often, religion has become a preoccupation with scriptural trivia. There was a certain British biblical scholar who once spent all of 17 years of study in counting every single verse, word, and letter in the entire King James Bible and in so doing, he found that it contains 3,566,480 letters, 773,693 words, 31,102 verses, 1,189 chapters, and 66 books. The longest chapter this scholar discovered is Psalm 119. The middle chapter is also the shortest chapter, the 117th Psalm. The middle verse in all the Bible, the very middle one, is verse 8 of the 118th Psalm, and in verse 21 of the 7th chapter of Ezra, all the letters of the alphabet occur, and the name of God is not even mentioned in the book of Esther. And yet it would be entirely possible for any person to know all of these facts about the Bible, to have memorized them without understanding a single truth which the Bible contains. For truth, forsooth, cannot be memorized. It is known in the soul. It's an experience. To recite the words fatherhood of God and brotherhood of man is not necessarily at all to comprehend them. These are known by living faith. Authentic religion directly influences your behavior, morality, interpersonal relationships. Recently, Dr. R. W. Ramsey of London, England, conducted a psychological study of law-breaking. And as a result, he discovered that 20% of the people tested said they did not commit crimes because conscience directed them or told them not to. 20% said they obeyed laws because breaking them would hurt other people. 15% said they were law-abiding because they feared punishment. And 45% said they wanted to be good simply for the sake of being good as a personal achievement. To summarize these findings, two-thirds of the people who obey laws do so either out of a positive concern for other people or a positive quest for personal goodness. Only 15% were good strictly out of fear, according to their report. Goodness literally is its own reward, but goodness, truth, and beauty are more than human values. They are of God, the source and center of all reality, the emotions of mind and body can be transformed into the more lofty loyalties of spiritual experience by this living faith. Although your troubles may remain the same, the way you react to your troubles can tremendously change. You need not remain the way you are. Human beings are adaptable. Human beings can live anywhere on this planet from the burning equator to the freezing poles and can likewise adapt to different problems and different situations in living if they choose to utilize the latent strengths which they possess. And the most profound of these latent strengths is spiritual, declared the master of masters. The kingdom of God is within you. The highest and noblest and truest and best in you has never found its full expression. Your life is a brim with undiscovered possibilities. You are a child of the infinite. If you would dare to believe it, and the flame of infinity burns within your mind, to become most fully what you were created and intended to be is the highest possible human joy of self-actualization, self-fulfillment. You may have endeavored to satisfy your spiritual hunger in a thousand different ways, yet unsuccessfully. You may have sought for solace in the acquisition of material possessions, in the pursuit of fame, in the quest for wealth, in a grasping for power, in sex or social prestige or entertainment or drugs or pleasure. You may have sought 
satisfaction in any or even all of these, yet there endures a disquietude of mind, a hungering of heart, a thirsting of spirit, which has not been satisfied. You may feel the way nutritionists and physicians have found many people feel when their diets are rich in empty calories. They feel full and yet unsatisfied. It is literally possible to be full of food physically with thousands of calories in your stomach and yet for your body to be ravenously undernourished. You could have a full stomach all day living on pastries, donuts, cake, popcorn, potato chips, coffee, soft drinks, candy bars, and pretzels, yet literally die of malnutrition. Any doctor in the land will instruct you that it is entirely possible to have a stomach full of empty calories. Millions have sickened and died from precisely this sort of malnutrition. Their genuine bodily needs for proteins, vitamins, minerals, and the proper array of nutritive foods had never been met. So it may be with your life, just as your stomach may be full of nutritionally empty foods, so your life. 24 hours a day, or at least the 16 hours a day you're awake, your life may be equally full of spiritually empty activities. You may object, you may say, but why is it that I'm not happy? I'm doing all of these different things which are all supposed to make me happy. Why am I not happy? You may be doing everything you want to, but are you doing everything you need to? Which are being met, your wants or your needs? They are different. If your doctor instructed you to begin eating nutritious foods, it would be necessary, would it not, in order to have the literal room, the space in your stomach for the nutritional foods, that you begin to eliminate the non-nutritional or harmful foods from your diet. Those foods are occupying the actual space in your stomach which nutritional foods could fill. Likewise, if you are to make room for those spiritual activities which your soul within you craves, it will be necessary to trim the trivialities of your life and eliminate unproductive activities. Said Jesus, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all other things will be added to you. In order to commence with greater things, it is often necessary to have done with lesser things. Said Jesus, what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world but lose his own soul? Just as surely as the stomach was made for food, your heart made for blood, your lungs for air, your soul was made for God. Multiplied millions of people on this planet are born and live and die without ever knowing why. This is the authentic tragedy of human existence, that until you know why you're alive, you're not. And until you have really come to know God, not merely to know about God, but to know God personally, you will not have discovered the full range of what it is to be alive, the entire spectrum of your human potentials, living as a cosmic citizen of a friendly universe, a son or daughter of the living and infinite God. If you're interested in these topics, write to us. We want to hear from you at the Spiritual Renaissance Institute, Box 3080, Oakhurst, California, 93644. That's the Spiritual Renaissance Institute, or abbreviated SRI. For those of you listening in other countries around the world, over our international satellite and shortwave network, let me spell the mailing address. SRI, Box 3080, Oakhurst, O-A-K-H-U-R-S-T, California, C-A-L-I-F-O-R-N-I-A, 93644, United States of America. I've written Finding God, Getting to Know God, Seven Principles of Prayer, Life After Death, What Does Happen When You Die? If you're interested in these topics, no cost, no charge, no obligation, nobody's going to come to your door with an attache case and try to sell you something. Simply write to the Spiritual Renaissance Institute Box, 3080 Oakhurst, California, 93644, USA. This is a non-sectarian, non-profit program proclaiming the dawning spiritual renaissance, the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man, the worldwide family of God. And so for now, this is Vern Benham Grimsley saying, may God's will be done by you. Good day.